Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message. Here's our hope that as you hear the word of God preached, that you would see Jesus more clearly and love him more deeply. And so over the next few moments, take notes, focus, and hear how the word of God is going to transform you. If you got a Bible, go to Acts chapter 28. Um, we will be there in just a moment, but I also want to invite you into something. And so uh, if you weren't here at the start of the service or you weren't here at the start of the stream, uh, Shauna shared some of what we're going to be doing uh, for the Easter season. Uh, but maybe you're like, okay, I didn't capture all of that. And so I want to give you a really easy way to do that. I'm going to actually give you two. And so one of those, if you're a, a website person, if you go to Easter at KHC, as in Kings Harbor Church, dot com, we actually have built out a website that's just about Easter. And so what you'll find on that site is you'll find um, videos of people's lives being transformed. You'll find invite resources. And so if you want something that you can post on your social media, that's available there. Uh, we're working on some content this week where we're going to be sharing. If you feel uncomfortable sharing your faith or sharing your story, uh, just some people who have walked in that, the Lord's gifted them in that, and they're going to begin to share their story there. And so just a ton of resources for you to do that. Now, if you're an app person, you're going to go to, it would, it would be similar, but if you open up the Kings Harbor app, if you don't have it, you can download it from any app store uh, and the app will change. In fact, you'll be like, wait a minute, why is my first window not what it used to be? Because we rebuilt it for just this season where the actual first page that you'll go to will actually be the Easter website if you want to have that resource on your person and just want to be able to pull out of your pocket and get there. And you don't have to type anything. So just a resource that you can keep coming back to week after week to help you prepare fully for the Easter season as we get closer to it. Pretty excited about that. Amen. Acts 28, 16 through 31, or also known as the very end of the book of Acts. So if you've been with us on this three-year journey, you have made it. Um, now, you just already know what my intro to my sermon is going to be next week. It's going to be like, all right, Acts chapter one. So I'm just telling you the joke ahead of time. Um, as we get there, um, let, let me tell you a story uh, this week. So um, I, I picked up my, my four-year-old after school, and he wanted to go get ice cream. And so we went to Yogurt Land. Um, and so we were at the Yogurt Land over off of Capitol and Western. And after we had gotten yogurt, we were leaving, and there's uh, Ralph's there. And he says, hey, dad, what's a red box? Oh. And I was like, what? And he was like, over there, it says red box on that thing. What is a red box? And so I'm like, how do I explain to you the history of movies and devices in a way that you'll understand? And so I was like, well, it's a box where people go to get movies if they want to watch them. And he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I know, this doesn't make any sense. I was like, because you just got to like turn on the TV and it's there. But let's say it's not on TV and you wanted to go get it and you didn't want to have to wait. You go to a thing like a red box. You put, and so like, I'm trying to explain to him this whole thing with DVDs and red boxes and all this stuff. And I'm like, how did we get here? Like, how did we get here in this conversation with me and him? But also like, how did we get here technologically where I, I can remember being a kid where like you'd go to Blockbuster and you'd have the thing on the box. And some of you are like, yeah, Blockbuster. Some of you are like, what? <laughs> uh, and so you, and you'd like have a VHS tape where it would say on there, be kind, rewind. And if you didn't, you got, fi you got, you got fined. They should have put that part on there. Be kind, rewind, or you're going to get fined. And because, so, because you actually had to rewind the movie back to the start, as opposed to like hitting a button, and it would be there. And so like, I was thinking like, how do I explain that to you? And that DVDs are better. And, then, and so like, it just became this whole thing. Like you have to understand where we've been to understand where we are, to understand where we're going. And as I was thinking about that, I was like, man, Acts chapter 28, 16 through 31. You have to understand where we've been to understand where we are, to understand where we're going. And so with that in mind, I just want to take some time this morning to go all the way back to chapter. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> See, I told you it was going to be funny. I just used it a week early. All right. So here's our main idea. The risen and exalted Jesus is establishing an unstoppable kingdom through a transformed, empowered, and unified people by the power of the Holy Spirit today. And you've seen most of that phrase before. You, that's the main idea for what we've been walking through in the book of Acts. It's the, uh, we've used it at different times in the series. And so uh, the end of that has been like in Samaria or in Athens or in various places. But for this morning's purposes, we're going to use that singular word today. And so it's all important. But I think the most important word in that whole sentence is today. And so what we're going to see in verses 16 through 24 is that we're going to see the same pattern. And then in verses 24 through 28, we're going to see 
the same results. And so let me pray one more time and then we're going to jump into the word. So Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you are doing something amongst the people today. And looking backwards at the book of Acts gives us an opportunity to see where we've been, the roots that you lay, the patterns that you set, the principles that you've set in the heavenlies that are part of the kingdom of God. And that we are called to play a role in the very story that we're not just um, a captive audience, but we are participants in the work that you're doing in this day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Acts 28, starting in verse 16, would say this. And when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there is no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I've asked to see you and speak with you, since it's because of the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. And they said to him, we've received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here have reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning until evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said and others disbelieved. Now, I, I want to locate us, even if you missed last week. Last week, we took quite a journey between the, the storm, the shipwreck, and the snake bite, and we were at Malta, and, and from Malta, we were beginning to make our way to Rome. And so verse 16, we have finally arrived. And Paul is now in a what we would call house arrest, uh, getting to live on his own. Later on in the text, it would tell us that for two years under his own expense that he lived on his own. But he's there for a few days. And the first thing that he does is he calls in the local Jewish leaders and says, hey, can I have a conversation with you? But you need to know the reason that I'm here. And so he begins to explain and we see him laying down the foundation of, hey, I've done nothing wrong. In fact, the Roman government, like the only reason that this is still going on is because the, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem didn't let this go. And so I needed to appeal. But he's like, honestly, I've been speaking about the hope that you've been looking forward to. And this really shouldn't be an issue, but I'm here and I want you to know. And their response is, yeah, I mean, we, we, we ain't heard anything bad about you. So, so tell us, what, what is this that you've been sharing that caused all of this controversy? Now, after what we read last week, I would expect a kind of more epic kind of like segue into Rome, right? Like we've been doing all this work for all of these chapters to get to Rome. And what we get is Paul hanging out at the house with some other people coming and him opening up the scriptures and talking to them. Like, it feels like it should be different, but the way that Luke's writing this, it feels like Luke is writing this as if, hey, just another Pauline mission trip. This is what he does. That he starts first with those that are Jews, and then he moves to the Gentiles, and he goes into the marketplace and begins to make a difference in the area that he's in. And so it's interesting that, the way, that we're beginning to see this pattern played out again, that he gets to a new place, that he begins to share uh, the, the faith of Jesus that he has with those who are of similar background to him, hoping that they would hear and know, hoping that they would be convinced that he would sit for day and night that, to try and explain to them that this is the way of Jesus. This is the kingdom of God. This is the hope that you've been looking for, that this is Paul's pattern. And it seems like regardless of the fact that he he's in chains, he's going to do the work that he was always set out to do. Can you imagine what that conversation would be like? Not just, not just for them, but for the guy that's the guard. Like if it's the same guard that day after day has to sit with Paul, I imagine after a certain period of time, like he's like chiming in on the message. Hey, talk to them about that thing about how Jesus is the true seed of Abraham. You didn't say that. You said that the other day when they came over. Like, like, I imagine that something's happening in this guy's heart. And so even while he's trying to focus on this group of Jewish leaders, trying to help them understand, at the same time, it's bleeding over even to those that are the bystanders of the work that he's doing. 
And we see this pattern and what happens often in the patterns that Paul would preach and proclaim and some would be convinced and others would disagree. Like, I just, I want to comfort you because I don't think we do this well. I think oftentimes, especially in the church, especially when we're trying to motivate people to do something, uh, we either like ignore negative results or we just kind of let negative results hang out there like that's your fault, not ours. Like we, we kind of operate like a consultant. One of, my, one of my goals in my life at some point is to be a consultant for somebody and something. Because I feel like as a consultant, here's what you get. You get, you get to give all the strategy and if it doesn't work, it was their fault. And I think we treat evangelism that way. Like we're gonna give you all these methods and tell you to do these things and go for it. If you didn't do it, it's your fault. But I actually think the reality is that even the best in the game don't have necessarily a sterling record of success. The way that this text sounds, it sounds that he, he convinced some and, and it seems like that's a smaller fraction and it seems like the greater majority were still um, disrupted and, and frustrated by what he was doing or at least questioning what he was saying and doing. And I just, I just wanna point to the Lord gives grace where the Lord gives grace. We be faithful and we don't care about the results. And so we see this pattern and Rome looks a lot like all the other places that Paul has been navigating up to this point. And then starting in verse 24, again, it says, and some were convinced by what he said and others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. So, like, I imagine they didn't walk away like, all right, well, thanks for sharing. Like, they probably walked away, this is why people want to kill you, bro. Like, we're trying to figure out what you're preaching. We don't know if we agree with you or not. And your response is you're going to say that our hearts are so thick that they can't be penetrated. Um, uh, the, the better translation of that would be like you're fat-hearted. Like, there's so much junk around your heart that you can't ever get to the core. That you're so deaf that, you, that even if something were able to get to your heart, you're not even listening well enough to even hear it. That you're blind and you cannot see that. Like he's, he's quoting something and, and see what he does here. Because earlier when we were reading the first verses, he says that uh, I haven't done anything against the customs of our fathers. But when you read what he says in 26, he, say, he, he says, uh, the Holy Spirit was right to say to your fathers. Like we're, we're in a different place. Like I'm not one of those that's heard and my heart was so thick that I didn't respond, that my ears were so dull that I couldn't hear, that my eyes were so blind that I couldn't see, that when the Lord was working, I, it was apparent to me and I responded to it. But you are acting like the generations before you, the generations that got sent into exile, the generations that didn't pay attention to the mercy of God that was being laid before them. You are like them. And then he's not quoting his own words. He's quoting the book of Isaiah which any good Jewish leader would have known the book of Isaiah. And that would have been one of those moments of, hold up, man. Why would you say that to us? And so, so maybe you, you don't know. And so Isaiah chapter six is where this is being quoted from. And so Isaiah chapter six starts with this beautiful moment of Isaiah is brought into this throne room moment with God where he is sitting on the throne and, and his train is filling the temple and the doorposts are shaking under the glory of God. The angels are around him crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. And Isaiah is standing there. And in that moment, Isaiah isn't like, Lord, aren't you glad I'm on your team? He cries out, I am a man of unclean lips amongst the people of unclean lips. Now, I want you to remember Isaiah is a prophet. The prophet's greatest tool is the prophet's lips because the prophet speaks is his job to declare the word of God to people. And so Isaiah is not even lamenting his weakness. Isaiah is lamenting his strength before the Lord. That even the best parts of me aren't holy and faithful in front of you. And then an angel takes the coal off of the fire, touches it to his lips and says, now you've been made clean. Your sin has been atoned for. 
And then Isaiah chapter six, verse eight would say this. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here, I, here am I, send me. Now, uh, here, growing up, this was always the verse that they would use at missions conferences. Right? Like, like, hey, like, who will go for the Lord? Here am I, send me. And nobody read verse 9 and 10 after that. And what Paul quotes is verses 9 and 10 after that. The Lord literally says to Isaiah, here's the thing that I'm sending you to. I'm going to send you to proclaim. And they're not going to listen. They're going to have hearts that can't receive it, ears that can't hear it, eyes that won't see it. You still in? And so Paul, standing on the other side of this, is standing there saying, I've proclaimed, I've said these things to you, and I'm not just saying that I recognize where you're at, I'm also saying I know what I signed up for. I know that I'm in the Isaiah position, that I've seen the goodness of the Lord that has made known to me the sinfulness of even the best parts of me. And, in, and because of that, he's changed my heart and changed my life. I understand the mercy of the kingdom of God that's been made available to me. And because of that, here's what he's called me to, whether you receive it or not, I'll declare him faithfully. There's this, this moment that he's saying that I, that I accept the responsibility even if I don't get the results. And so again, we see, like we've seen throughout the ministry of Paul, that he would declare to his own people and whether they received it or not, then he would begin to declare, and we see it in verse 28, to the Gentiles believing that they would hear. And then if we were to read 30 and 31, and we'll do that in just a moment, it's just a summary of what he does for the next couple of years. And so what do we do with that? If the main idea is that the risen and exalted Jesus is establishing an unstoppable kingdom through a transformed, empowered, and unified people by the power of the Holy Spirit today, it doesn't feel unstoppable because people ignored it. It doesn't feel like it has anything to do with today because it's actually kind of a non-climactic ending. Like, you would imagine, uh, so... Uh, I'll admit to you, I'm an avid TV watcher. And you know when you're watching a show when it's the season finale or a series finale. Because they're like kind of rushing to try and get all these things kind of like summed up. If it's the really the end of the show, they're not introducing new characters. Like you don't have like this mysterious figure showing up on the last episode of a show and don't have the time to figure it out. And so like you're reading this and you're like, wait a minute, we're at Rome, we're seeing a new conflict, he's laying out some new, new data. It doesn't feel like this is the end of a story, but at the same time, it doesn't feel as epic as it should. Like it feels like there's something that should happen, like an angel should come down and be like, look Rome, we're here and we're taking over. And that doesn't happen. Like isn't that the tension of the very start of the book where they say to Jesus, hey, are you gonna establish the kingdom now? And he's like, it's not time for you to know. But certainly, Jesus, if we get all the way to the center of power and you got your guy there and you got these people listening to him, surely things are about to take off. And so for the next two years, we got to run at this thing. We're taking over. We're going to change Caesar's heart. All of a sudden, we got this thing. That's not what 30 and 31 gives you. It says that he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. It feels a little bit of like a letdown. He lived and paid his bills, welcomed people that showed up, and proclaimed the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus with boldness and without hindrance. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it feels like there should be something more to it than that. And so let me walk through just a a few points that I think help us see, uh, see it rightly and respond to it faithfully. And so here's the first one. And we've actually said this all throughout the book. The book of Acts is both descriptive and prescriptive. Um, descriptive meaning that it's, it's telling you the details of a story. And so it's descriptive in its details, but it's prescriptive in its principles. And early on in the book, particularly when we were uh, talking about the, the gifts of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, we took the time to, to walk through this because I think there are times where something that's a description of details, if you take that and make it a prescription for your life, that can, that can become really odd really quickly. 
And so we, we're kind of trying to guard against that. But I'll tell you, my bigger fear with the book of Acts is not that we take things that are descriptive and make them prescriptive, but we, take, but we, we actually don't respond to the things that are actually prescriptive. I just, I want your heart to wrap around that since 2019, for the last three years, we haven't been walking through this book because we needed to do story time with Mike and we needed something long enough to put you to sleep. But there's this call that we're not just hearing the details of 2,000 years ago, but that we're being called into something as a people, that there's a prescription, a command, a, 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 an imperative from the Lord that's saying that you as a people stand faithfully in this way. That when challenge comes, when trouble comes, when there's an invitation that in the mundane paying of your bills and welcoming everybody that comes, that you boldly proclaim the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus without hindrance. Yeah, that it's a call to something, not just the narration of a really good story. Here's the second thing. The triumph of the gospel. Uh, in your... Um, Acts study guides, it actually would say it this way. Um, this is, uh, it's a little shortened a little bit, but it's the same idea. The more the good news of the kingdom spreads, the more we see opposition arise. Nevertheless, despite the best efforts of earthly kings to oppose God's kingdom, the true king will ultimately triumph. What's interesting to me about the way that Luke ends the story is it almost feels like Paul's not the point. Like we've spent, since around chapter nine, watching this guy's life develop. We've seen him go from being a persecutor of the church, having warrants to arrest, other, to, to arrest Christians. We've seen him be knocked to the ground, see the glory of the Lord, respond to that. We've seen his life be in jeopardy because people think that he's like a double agent. We've seen him go to places where people think that he's a God. And then when he denies them calling him a God, they try to kill him with stones and like drag him out of town. And he gets up and brushes himself off and keeps going. We see him get in ships and go to places where he ends up getting arrested in the middle of the night. Earthquakes happen. The Lord lets him out. Like we see some amazing things in this guy's life. And at the very end of it, instead of Luke telling us, well, he was there for two years and then he ended up being martyred at this point, like Luke almost makes it seem like he's not the point. That if he moves off the stage and somebody else moves on it, the point is that the work that's being done in this book is Jesus through the spirit amongst the willing people. And so the reason that this, this statement is true, that the risen and exalted Jesus is establishing an unstoppable kingdom, full stop, it doesn't matter who the people are, it matters that Jesus and his spirit are doing work amongst them. And so thus is the triumph of the gospel. If we were to read in the book of Romans, Paul would write unapologetically to the Roman church, hey, I actually just want to visit you so I can get to Spain. It would be helpful if Luke told us, and this is how we got to Spain. But Luke doesn't give us that. But human history gives us that. So the gospel would get to Spain. And from Spain, it would get to other places in Europe and other places in Asia and Africa. It eventually would cross the Atlantic Ocean. It would get to North America. Somehow, when it got to North America, it began to spread and it became what we were as a people. And all of a sudden, it lands in this place called California. In fact, most of the names of cities, such as San Diego, San Francisco, are named because there were missions there that point to something. And then all of a sudden, it, it began to have this groundswell and it ended up in Los Angeles. You may not know this, but Los Angeles, particularly Hollywood, was actually established to be this place for believers to get away for the rest of the world. That didn't work out, but that was the plan. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, this community is being established for people. And then even beyond that, there is this uh, young lady named Amy Simple McPherson that married an Irish guy in a revival together. They begin to feel the spirit of God. It became, became alive. And what birthed in her heart is in every city around Los Angeles, I want to see churches planted. I want to see people having local communities that they can know the faith of Jesus right around them. Amongst that, people begin to get their heart around that. And all of a sudden, now in this location where we are, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been made known. And so what I know is that we may not know all the names from Paul to here, but we know that the kingdom has triumphed. 
We know that regardless of the number of opposition, the number of Caesars that tried to bur- who tried to blame Christians for fires that happened in Rome, for the number of wars, for the sicknesses, for all the things, the plagues that have happened over all the centuries, all of those things have come and gone, but the thing that's still standing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that the gospel has triumphed. So that leads me to, that was really like a 25 minute preamble to get you to the point. (laughs) That if the Lord is establishing an unstoppable kingdom through a transformed, unified and empowered people by his spirit today, then we need power. That we need the spirit's power to fulfill our role in the story. Um, I mentioned this before, if you're watching this later on, you, this won't make sense because you won't see the start of the service uh, after it gets cut down for, for on demand. Um, but at the start of our service, Shauna shared an opportunity for us to um, invite people to be part of what the Lord's doing here at Easter. And for some of you, that probably felt like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with you people? That, that intimidates me. We don't need better strategies, though they're helpful. We need power. Maybe it has nothing to do with anything about proclaiming the kingdom of God to somebody else, but maybe believing that the gospel would take root in your heart and the things that you're facing, that the king can triumph over those things. We need power to believe. So I, I just, as I was preparing this morning, I was like, how do I depict this? Maybe I go to Timothy where, Timothy, where Paul's writing to him. He says that there's a form of godliness, but they deny its power. And maybe we, we dig into that. Or maybe we spend some time and, and look at things like Isaiah. Or maybe we spend some time and look at things like Philippi, where he literally says, I'm chained next to prisoners and they're coming to faith and it's awesome. And I was thinking through all of that. The Lord was like, why don't you just give him an opportunity to get power and shut up? He didn't talk to me like that, but like in my mind, that was like in parentheses. And so I'm just gonna, Make space. And I don't think it doesn't make great for for great video to watch people pray. But maybe you're sitting here and you're like, man, to hear the end of Paul's story, that for two years that he boldly talked about the kingdom of God and then talked about the way of Jesus and he did it with boldness and without hindrance. I'd love to be able to do that. I wish I had what he had. You do. You've got the Spirit's power. But maybe that doesn't feel real to you. Or maybe that feels distant from you. So I just want to make space to ask the Lord to empower us, to transform us, to unify us for his purposes, that he could use us as a people to be a beachhead for the kingdom that's unstoppable. It doesn't matter about anybody's name. It's not about us. But it's about him receiving the glory that he's due even in the midst of us being in a, in a world and in a season that doesn't seem like it would point to or receive that. Maybe we feel like a room full of Isaiahs that I have been trying to share, but it feels like their hearts are too thick and their ears are too dull and their, their eyes are too blind. And for us to stay faithful, we need power. Maybe it feels like the the, the task is too great and the, and the hill to climb is too high. I'll, I'll tell you, when I, when I came back from paternity leave, I, I had a, a conversation with somebody. It's not the only person, but this one jumps out of my mind. Um, we were in our series, The Prevailing Church. And the last few messages that, of that series had to do with the, with the outward focus of the church. And so I came back and I, and I had the opportunity to talk about um, a, a press into global missions. And so if you've been around me as long as you have, you know, I, I get a little bit of happy when I start preaching about global missions. And so as I'm, I'm leaning in and preaching that message, I, I have a conversation with somebody right after. And they're like, don't you feel like it's an inappropriate time in the middle of a pandemic? Our, our church is trying to find its footing again for us to, to be challenging the church to be that serious about proclaiming the name of Jesus to those that don't know. And it was a good, honest-hearted question that I don't begrudge, and I'm actually grateful for the person having the courage to ask it. And the reality is everything that they said is true. It was hard then. I'll be honest with you, it's hard now. 
that while maybe the way that we're interacting with COVID and it maybe it's not, it's maybe not on the front of our minds in the way that it has been over the last two years, it certainly feels like we're trying to find our way, maybe even more so than before. It certainly feels like it was the great reveal. And so some of the things that were beneath the surface that we could manage to hold together because we could do this for 90 minutes at a time and kind of put on our best face, we don't have that energy anymore. And so everything that they said is true. And it doesn't negate the call. It just reminds me how much more we need power. So if the Spirit of God is available to provide the people of God what they need to be faithful to the mission of God in their day because he's revealing the kingdom, why don't we ask him for it? And so this is going to feel old school. It ain't going to be sophisticated or like if you would wink three times with your left eye. If you're hearing what the Lord's calling you to, and you feel unequal to the task, and you're like, I need the Spirit's power. I just want to invite you to stand up. If you're like, Lord, I know you want to use me, but I just don't feel like I'm capable. But if you promise that you would, that we would receive power when the Spirit comes upon us, then would you fill us afresh with your Spirit? So I just want to, I just want to pray for you. And I just want you to posture yourself to receive. That may be hands up. That may be hands out. That may be kneeling. It may be any number of things. But if, if I just want you to put yourself in a place where you said, okay, Lord, if you are giving power in this way, I want to receive it. And so let's just go before him together. Spirit of the living God. I feel this, this angst in my heart. Not a bad angst, but uh, maybe a better word is Expectation. That, Lord, you want to do something in the midst of your people in a way that sets us free from uh, not physical chains, but the, the emotional, the spiritual, the mental chains that bind us. And I know that there are, there are, um, slow strategies, faithful strategies that help people see and understand and work through. But uh, my understanding is that, that there's this moment when the Spirit accelerates and intensifies His work in such a way that would have, what would have taken years to happen all of a sudden happens in a moment in your presence. And so, Lord, I'm just asking in the best way that I know how, with, the, with all the humility that I can, but would you allow this to be that moment? That, Lord, would you wake up the, the sleeping lion that is your people? That would there be this roar that comes out of us because of the power of God that's in us, that we with boldness and unhindered, without any obstacle able to stop us because of the unstoppability of the kingdom of God that's flowing out of us, your rule and reign over your people on earth being displayed, would you endue your people with power? Would this be this kind of explosive living that as we walk from day to day, that maybe it's two years of just paying the bills and welcoming people, but every chance that we get, that we live and operate in power, that there's this understanding that you've placed down in us because of the goodness of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross, your spirit, but it's not meant to be this reservoir that stays in us, but it's meant to flow out of us. And so Jesus, whether here or watching at home, could there be just this igniting of the flame in the hearts of your people? Would there be this power to live, this power to fight sin, this power to uh, to pursue holiness, this power to believe you at your word, for this power to to follow after Jesus? Would you allow us to receive what you promised that you just so generously want to give? I'm only asking you because it's polite. You want to do this more than we want to receive it. Would you pour out your power on a people this morning? It's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Amen. Again, thanks for watching this message online. 
And here's our hope, that you didn't just hear the word of God, but that it compels you to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what we mean by that. We're not just giving you information, but we believe that there's steps that you take afterwards to obey Jesus, to serve the world around you, to give sacrificially, and to go to others who haven't heard the message. And so one, we would love to know you, particularly if you're in the Southern California area. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello, you can send us a digital connect card, and we would love to follow up with you, just get to know you better. We also hope that you didn't just hear a message and then just stow it away somewhere, but it compels you to obey and follow the way of Jesus. Uh, We pray that you do that in community. That's the best way to live this out. You can live it out. We just don't believe you should live it out alone. Uh, On top of that, we we believe that this is an opportunity to serve. And whether that's you serving uh, the church or the community around you, that those who follow Jesus reflect Jesus by the way that they serve. Then we would ask that you give. Giving is not something that is uh, just kind of a tradition in the church. It's evidence that you fully trust Jesus in every dimension of your life. And then finally, we're praying that you go, that you would share this with someone else, that if the Lord has impacted you by his word to see Jesus better and love him more deeply, that you'd invite others to do the same by either sharing this message with them or entering into community with them and sharing what the Lord has done. So we're excited to hear from you, to connect with you, and to hear about what the Lord's doing through his word and in your life.